probably at this point. Um, and so with that, Mark, I, I'd love to hand it over to you and you can kind of kick off however you want to or whatever feels comfortable for you. Um, as you know, I have a, a few questions to get us started and then I'll also let other people chime in with their questions. Um, but would love for you to share a little bit about your connection to Wyoming and then anything else you want to share before we get started as well. So thanks for being with us. Well, it's a pleasure, Mandy, and thanks very much for inviting me. And especially thanks for showing me about the raise hand function, which I've been using Zoom so extensively over the last uh, uh, month or so. And there you go, I'm still learning new things at my age. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's great to be with you. I, I actually wish I could have been there in person. Um, when I was, I think, 13 years old, which as you can tell by looking at me, uh, was quite a long time ago. Uh, my parents, I grew up in New York. My parents put me on a Greyhound bus, uh, which I took to Denver and then changed buses and took it to Lander, Wyoming, uh, which was the first time I'd ever been uh, any place west of the Rockies. Uh, and I was out for my first Knowles course at age 13 uh, and spent um, a month in Wyoming pretty much every summer uh, or more than a month in Wyoming, pretty much every summer for the next 10 plus years. So um, a lot of fantastic and important times in my life took place in Wyoming. And I'm, I'm being totally sincere when I say it really is uh, a happy place for me. And I don't just mean being up in the winds or being in the Tetons or being any of the other places that I've traipsed around out in the wilderness. Um, you know, I love the towns and I love the cities. and. As you know, there have been some quite some interesting challenges in getting to Wyoming recently, uh, especially with trying to fly into Riverton. So for the last three or four years, I've been in the habit of flying into Casper and then making the drive. And even now, though, everyone assures me that uh, there's more reliable service into Riverton. I'm going to keep flying into Casper because, quite frankly, I just love that drive. It just reminds me of everything that I love about that state. Uh, so it, it is, I, I'm very sincere in saying I'm really happy to be with you guys because my heart really is in, um, is in Wyoming. All three of my children um, have taken Knowles courses. Uh, my daughter is a Knowles instructor. Uh, my brother, my nephew. I'm, 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 I think I'm in probably second or third place for most family uh, weeks in the field for, uh, with Knowles. But I, got, I still have a way to go, so I'm not giving up, uh, I'm not giving up yet. And the last thing I'll mention, because you have to talk about Knowles, at least when looking at my connection with, with this group, is I certainly went on to a very different career than being a Knowles instructor, which is what I was doing during my summers in college and shortly thereafter. But I am completely uh, sincere in saying that uh, almost everything I've ever learned about leadership, almost everything I've ever learned about being an entrepreneur um, came from um, all the time that I spent in the mountains with Knowles. There's just so few places in the world where you can take a 13 or 14 or 15 or 18 or 25 year old and give them real decision-making responsibility with real consequences and then more importantly, have them find out an hour, three hours, or a day later, the consequences of those decisions. Uh, I can assure you most people don't, are not in a position where they have to make real decisions and then feel the real consequences until they're in their late 20s or early 30s, and some people never. Um, and I feel incredibly fortunate. And the whole nature of being an entrepreneurial leader where you're forced to make decisions um, with uh, incomplete or inconclusive or even contradictory information where you have to communicate things to your group that you're not entirely sure of, nor are you sure of the direction you're going, um, that you have to make decisions about how fast to go and what to bring with you and when to stop and when to rest. Those are all the things you do every day in a startup. And those are all things that I had to do every single day um, out in the mountains. So anyway, there, there's a lot of reasons why I look back on my time um, with Knowles as being so formative for me. And the last little piece about Knowles is that perhaps um, uh, must be 
more than 15 years ago now when I left um, Netflix and all of a sudden for the first time in 40 years had time. Uh, and I was spending a lot of time uh, doing um, backcountry skiing and kind of realized that maybe, just maybe, the avalanche skills that I had learned 35 years earlier, uh, there might have been some improvements in the intervening years. Uh, the same goes for being safe and comfortable in winter camping, and it never occurred to me to go anyplace other than Knowles to pick those skills back up, which saw me, uh, again, in the Tetons in the middle of winter on a backcountry snowboarding um, course where there was me in my 40s, and then the next oldest person was 23, and then a 21-year-old, and then three 18-year-olds. Um, and besides learning the skills um, and refreshing myself and what it took to be safe and comfortable in the mountains in the middle of winter, I learned that uh, strength and that grit and perseverance are way more powerful than youth and strength uh, when it comes to um, hauling a 75-pound uh, sled for two weeks. So there was an interesting lesson I took away from Knowles as well. Well, anyway, that's Mandy, awesome. there, there's my intro. Uh, yeah, we that's awesome. Where you want to go. That's a great, uh, you sort of with unknowingly backed up um, a recent story I told to our alumni network about winter, winter courses working for Knowles and the diff like how hard you work and how much you shovel snow constantly. <laughs> Um, and the difference of a, it's snowing and then, you know, you have to shovel whatever snow is there versus it's snowing and you don't know when it's going to stop snowing and you feel like you might have to just shovel forever. And that was, was the experience for me on, my, on a course that I worked previously. So I was trying to convince them quite seriously that rather than call it backcountry snowboarding, it should be called backcountry shoveling. And in that, all sincerity, with a touch of snowboarding. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, you, the total vertical you do in two weeks yeah. is less you than do. you do in a single day <laughs> at the resort. And you all know, I don't know how much of you guys know this, but all the old courses are sent out with an acronym. You know, they have three letters at the front uh, to designate what kind of a course it is. And I was really lobbying for it to be SHV to be what they call the backcountry <laughs> <Yeah>. snowboard. <laughs> Shove. Exactly, <laughs> That's shovel. awesome. I love it. That's great. Well, and that's maybe a good segue of how did you find yourself in the role of Mark, the entrepreneur, and how did you sort of land in this spot where you said, okay, this is it for me. This is my calling or my path, or this is what I want to be doing um, from being kind of wilderness guide. So, you know, these days there's this thing called being an entrepreneur that you can take classes at school and, uh, it's, 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 it's something you can become or want to become or even know you want to become it. And of course, when I was doing this 40 years ago, there wasn't any such thing or people certainly didn't talk about it. Um, it was always a, something that I was compelled to do. Uh, I won't say the compelled to start companies, but to see the world as a imperfect place, as things that always needed to get fixed. Uh, I always saw problems. Um, and I saw holes that I had to fill. And seriously, it's always been like that. I kept a little notebook. This is when I was young, probably seven or eight years old, of inventions, which was things that might solve these little everyday problems that I was doing. I was the type of person who in middle school and in high school, um, I was starting clubs and I was doing little publications and I was selling things. Um, I just had this desire that if I saw something that needed to be done, I would just try and figure out a way to do it. Uh, and one thing led to another. Because um, in their nature, like for example, in, in college, just out of the one of the many things, I, I majored in geology, but I usually describe it that I majored in extracurricular. And I don't mean drinking and partying. I mean, I spent most of my time and attention on the extracurricular activities I was doing. Like I was the, not surprisingly, president of the outing club. But I also was putting together a trips program. I put together a gear purchase program. I started a magazine. I started a humor magazine. We did, we put on plays. And that process of what am I gonna do? 
How am I going to find the funding for this? How am I going to recruit people to help me when I can't pay them? And I have to do this purely with enthusiasm and vision. Uh, and you, you was, I was doing that in this atmosphere where it was relatively risk-free. If I failed, there was no real consequence. Um, I still had a cafeteria where I could eat. I still had a bed to sleep in at night. I didn't have mortgage payments. And it was the perfect place to experiment with how do you apply leadership to getting concrete things built um, and accomplished. So in a way, the Knowles was a separate thing. It, that was my scratching the outdoors itch. That was my um, teaching. Uh, that was my leadership piece. And the entrepreneurship thing was just, just happened that way. Awesome. And how, as you, as that sort of led into Netflix, and for those of you who read the book, you kind of know a little more about the story, but for, for maybe those who haven't, how did that land or flow into this concept of, okay, we're going to go for this pretty big thing. Um, what was your sort of path to stepping into that role? I assume you mean Netflix when you say this pretty big thing. Or do you mean... <laughs> yeah. Did I not mention Netflix? <laughs> no. I, I just want to. Well, the, yeah. the, the, the funny thing is I was clarifying that, but I could have answered the question regardless of what you were talking about. Because quite frankly, you know, so Netflix was one of seven companies I've had a hand in starting. Um, and two of them were big, um, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. But, you know, one of them crashed and burned. One of them was barely limped along. Other ones had IPOs. But, and this is quite sincerely, if you had asked me on day one, which would be which for any of the seven, I never could have told you. So when you start them, you're not going, oh, I think I'm going to start this and let's see if we can have it go out of business in three years. And let's see if we can start this and see if it can end up having 150 million subscribers. No, yet all of them are just like, this seems like an interesting thing to try. Sure, all of them have the potential to be large if we can make them work. But at the beginning, we're trying to solve elementary problems. Can we get any customers? Um, can we build a, for Netflix, can I build a website that works? Is anyone going to rent DVDs by mail? How am I going to find DVD owners? You're never thinking about scale. You're never thinking about big. Those are all things that, if you're lucky, uh, land in your lap. But at the beginning, it is all struggle, it's all small. And, and the fun part is not the sense of, oh, if I get this right, I'm wealthy or famous or any of those things. It's these are really interesting puzzles. And I get to sit around the table with really smart people and spend my day trying to figure them out. Will you give us a couple examples of a couple of puzzles that stood out, maybe Netflix or maybe if it's from another company that you still think back on and think like, gosh, that we did a really cool thing or we came up with a really cool solution faced with that problem. Well, sure, I'll give you two. Um, and one of course is a, uh, was fairly straightforward and worked almost off the bat. And the first, I'll just go to the very beginning. So, you know, on day one, when we launched Netflix, this was in April of 1998. So in about two weeks from now, it'll be almost exactly uh, 22 years. So a long time ago. And we had bet this business, the business, Netflix originally, I mean, some of you looking around at the demographic, I think a lot of you remember that Netflix originally was mailing, especially in Wyoming, mailing DVDs back and forth. Uh, it was not streaming. But when we launched that company, DVDs had just come out of test market. So hardly anybody owned a DVD player. I mean, they cost a thousand dollars. And so we were trying to launch this national company selling into an audience where there wasn't anybody who owned DVD players. So you go, how do I find DVD players to promote this business to? Um, and there certainly weren't mailing lists you could buy. There wasn't a DVD magazine, nothing. And so there is a great hard problem. And, uh, the way we solved that, or the way we thought it might be solved, we, went, we realized, why aren't there more DVD players? And it's because, for the most part, why would you buy a DVD player? There weren't any DVDs. I mean, no movies were out in DVDs, no video stores carried DVDs, no stores at all carried DVDs. So you can't sell DVD players. And I said, well, why aren't there more DVDs out there? 
Well, because there's no DVD players. It was the classic chicken and egg problem. And we realized, wow, we could maybe solve this chicken and egg problem. And so I decided in my uh, overly self-confident way that maybe I can convince the DVD manufacturers to put a sticker on the box or a coupon in the box that says, if you buy this player, you'll get free DVD rentals. Because that will allow the DVD manufacturer to say, if you buy this player, here is a source. But when I say my overly self-confident way, I hadn't counted on the fact that the DVD manufacturers were largely Japanese and Korean manufacturers, extremely conservative, long supply chains. Uh, they were head, the American parts of them were headquartered in New Jersey. And to convince them to put a sticker on the box or a coupon inside from a company which had been in business for a total of three weeks, had a negative balance sheet, was doing, it was an internet company. It was the ultimate act of a hubris. And I spent months living essentially out of my car in the parking lots in, in these suburban office parks in New Jersey, trying to convince these companies to finally, um, finally do it. So there was a classic example of a hard, tricky problem. And then the, now I'm gonna write, now writ large is that when we launched, you know, like the book, as you probably know, is called That'll Never Work. Because when we told people, when I told people the idea, uh, potential investors, potential employees, friends, you know, even my wife, that, that I was doing, wanted to do DVD rental by mail, the universal reaction was, well, that'll never work. And it turns out they were right that once we launched this thing, uh, nobody wanted to rent from us. And if they rented from us once, they wouldn't rent from us again. Uh, and so thus began the real, the real struggle, the real problem, which is how are we gonna convince people to rent DVDs by mail when there is a blockbuster on every corner? And that one, wasn't a couple of months in an office, you know, sleeping out in the car in an office park in New Jersey. That was a year and a half of trying hundreds, if not thousands of different ideas, you know, some which gave you glimmers, some which gave you little bits of progress, but sequentially over and over and over trying different things until we finally solved that problem with the most crazy counterintuitive idea you can imagine, which was no due dates, no late fees, subscriptions. And if you had asked me on day one, you know, on April 14th, 1998, what do you think the business model will look like that ultimately will let you have a repeatable, scalable model that rents DVDs? I never in a million years would have guessed that. If you would give me multiple choice, I would never <laughs> got it right. So th there's two really hard problems, one that we solved in a few months and one that took us uh, more than a, almost two years to solve. One of the things that gets credited toward the Netflix culture and your evolution is a lot of that agility of the ability to move from one concept or framework to another, or try new things and push into a new industry. And I think they've continued to do that even at your departure in some ways. Being on the ground floor of building the company, was that an intentional part of the design or how do you create agility um, in a company, even as it's growing and changing? Well, it's, it's an interesting problem. Uh, and in some ways, all startups have that agility. And it's by necessity that when you're a startup, when you have 12 people and you're trying to launch a company, especially in the case of Netflix, launch a company in the face of a blockbuster, it's brutal. I mean, there is hundreds of things broken hundreds of things crying out for attention. And quite frankly, you do not have time to deal with all of them. Um, and so what you have to do is you have, you, you can, well, let me, let, me, let me back up a second. Um, let's use a, a mountaineering, a, a backpacking example. Uh, you don't have time to tell it in a crisis to tell everybody what to do you have to basically empower people to use their best judgment to solve the problem. And all you can really do is say, all right, you see that mountain peak? I might do this with my finger. You see that mountain peak over there? We're all gonna meet 
at the base in two weeks. And you, I, I trust that you will bring all the gear and get the gear there. And you're gonna figure out how to find the gear. You're gonna make sure we have the food. I need you to do all the reconnaissance and what the route is. And I'm not gonna check in you, we don't have time. I'm gonna trust that in two weeks when we assemble at the base, everyone has gotten their piece of the puzzle complete. And, and that's how that works, you know, if you're trying to put together a team. When in a startup, it's the exact same thing. You just do not have time. So everyone acts independently. But what happens is, the problem is, what happens when the company gets bigger? It's easy when you have 10 people, but then something weird happens. Someone is late. Uh, they don't get there on time. And so what you do is you say, oh, oh, this isn't good. Uh, this person's late. Okay, from now on, I want everyone to check in with me every four or five <laughs> days. I want you to write a status report, all of you. That way we'll know if anyone's gonna be late. And everyone goes, oh, status reports, okay, okay. And then someone, boy, starting to gesticulate wildly. Go then, for it. <laughs> <laughs> then somebody um, spends too much on the food, whatever it is. And you go, oh, this is not good, we spent too much. So you say, from now on, all expenses over $100 need prior approval. And everyone goes, oh, expense reports. And pretty soon, this lean team of people who are motivated and all acting independently and all excited about this, they're all going, this sucks. You know, you've, now we're all writing expense reports and now we're all filling out, uh, now we're all doing status reports and filling out expense approvals. And, and what happens is all these people who at the beginning were all motivated and able to work independently, they quit. And instead, you end up with all these people who just are happy to plod along, uh, writing expense, doing expense reports and writing uh, status reports. I mean, so yes, it is built into the DNA of a company at the beginning to be nimble, to recognize that you have to not, you have to do what the future requires and not be beholden to the past. But it's really hard. And and, and I gave I gave a bad example, a more common example of how cultures creep up in a company but it also happens innocuously let's say you're crushing it your company is doing phenomenally well and you go wow this is awesome we're just clicking along and then you begin going wow let, i wonder if we could shave a few points off the margin here uh i wonder if we could shorten our supply chain and there are people in the world who are phenomenally good at that stuff at things like, I don't even know what Seven Sigma is, but I guess that's one of those things that people are really good at. <laughs> and, um, uh, but it's building efficiency into an existing process. And they do that for a few quarters in a row and the, the margins are getting better and the supply chain shortening, but then the world changes. All of a sudden, they don't want your product the way you were delivering it, they want it a different way. And those people are all the wrong people. They're really good at taking an established process and making it more efficient. They're really bad at figuring out how to do things in a half-assed way as you figure out your way toward a whole new way of doing things. So you got me okay. started on a whole cultural thing, which could, we could yeah. end up going off the rails big time on this one since I'm a big one. <laughs> well, I, but I think, I, so one of the questions we have is about failure, which I think you have talked about pretty openly of what it's like to face failures and rise back up from failures. Um, so what are your thoughts on, even as a leader, how do you create a culture that you yourself can take risks big enough that you might fail and that your employees have the backing or the confidence to take risks um, that they might fail? So part culture, but kind of around this taboo subject of failing. So, I am not one of those people who's in the fail fast and fail early and all that crap, or it's certainly not into this whole, the whole genre of journalism, which is failure porn, you know, which is everyone talks about all of my failures. And I'm just not a big believer in that. But, uh, and, and one of the questions I get asked a lot is, what's a big failure? And I just don't think that way. And it's not because I've never made mistakes. And 99 percent, 99 times out of 100, the things I try don't work. But I don't view those types of things as failures. I just believe, see them as iterative approaches toward an endpoint. And it's the confidence and the comfort 
to continue to trying things, whether you know they're gonna work or not. Because the opposite is this paralysis, where you have this idea and you're so scared of trying it because you don't want it to not work, that you keep trying to figure some evidence that you know it will work. Or even worse, you begin building it in this perfect, comfortable environment in your head and you've never subjected it to the real world. Um, so how do you do that with a team? Well, if you think, go back to the initial analogy of this group trying to get ready to scale a peak, um, you're not telling them, let me know what you're gonna pick so I can approve it. You're going, I trust you that in two weeks when we show up, you're really good at this. You'll have the right gear we need and that you will have all the right and right quantity of the food we need. And you will have the maps or the course, the, the uh, route worked out, and you'll have dealt with the rescue or the first aid, whatever you're assigned them to, you trust them. Um, you give them this complete freedom to solve the problem as they need to solve it. But at the same time, you've given them the real responsibility that we're counting on you to be there at this point. And it turns out that is what people love. That's what they, that's what they thrive on. It's very, very hard to preserve that as the company gets larger because of what I talked about before, because of the whole, well, someone's late. But ultimately, I believe you got to build your company for the people who have good judgment, not put in place all these guardrails to allow you to have a company full of people with bad judgment. Two phrases that I like that I've heard you use in other podcasts or in your book as well, um, time to insight and validation hacking. You can pick one or both of those, but can you talk a little bit more about how you iterate in order to get those insights back? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to uh, a story I started telling a second ago, just so you don't get too confused, uh, which is at the beginning, when we launched this company, we had the idea of doing DVD rental by mail, um, and it did not work. And there was this panic that, oh my gosh, we, we have to get this to work. And it wasn't like I had a shortage of ideas. I had tons of things that I was ready to try. The problem is I was a bit of a perfectionist. So I'd be designing these tests that in some ways were kind of works of art. We, we commissioned custom photography or we lovingly craft every single word of copy. You know, we would make sure the layout was just so, we would test every link, we would stress test the site, and then we're ready to roll out the test. But it would take us three weeks, and then the test would fail. And we'd kind of look around and said, we just wasted three weeks. Okay, maybe we should go a bit faster. And we'd figure out how to roll out a test in a week, and it would fail. We go, wow, it was a week, okay, faster. And then we began doing tests uh, in two days. And then pretty soon we could do a test every day. And then eventually we're doing three or four tests in the same day. And as you can imagine, when you're going that fast, um, things are getting, what are you, sloppy? Um, you're having, there's typos, there's you know, misspellings, you'll have the wrong image, or you'll have left the watermark, or pages that you greeked end up going out as greeked. Um, you're, dead links and where you crash the site. Um, and it was terrible. <laughs> but there was an amazing insight from this, which is that it didn't make a difference. Because if it was a bad idea, that even putting together these perfect tests didn't make it a good idea. But if it was a good idea, if the idea actually had merit, it didn't make a difference how shoddily implemented it was because people immediately would raise their hands. They'd shine the spotlight on it. You know, they would re try and reboot the site. They'd try and call us. And we didn't have an, a listed phone number. I mean, seriously, people would come to the door of the office. And then, then you know, wow, that is something that's worth the effort to fix. So this insight was that, it was not about coming up with good ideas. It was all about building this system and this process and this culture to allow us to try thousands of bad ideas, to iterate super, super, super quickly, 
that not to have anything precious, to throw it out there. And in all the years at Netflix and every startup I've been involved in, I've never gotten to the bottom. Meaning I've never done something so shoddy that I went, oh, whoa, that, that was terrible. I, it's, it's fine, it's always worked. Now, I don't have time to run through the participant with the chat and see. If you are in the business of building a, uh, a medical device, then maybe you should not listen to this quite as carefully. But the, I think you're safe here. I think they're yeah. all out building medical devices right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know what I mean. You know, yeah. and um, this time to insight. You, when we when we started Netflix, if you had the idea, I'd love to try doing DVD under my mail from a website. It wasn't like it is now, where you can just go onto the cloud and get an instance of a website and you're in business. And all of a sudden you need a payment portal, great, there's PayPal. You wanna do, uh, right. you want to do uh, analytics, then you just sign up for Optimizely. It's, it's easy, it's cheap. Back then, if you wanted a website, you had to build it yourself. If you wanted to hook up to the banks, you had to build those payment portals yourself. You wanted security, you did it yourself. You wanted the network redundancy, you did it in your own servers. It was brutal. So it took us six months and a million dollars just to test this idea. So I say that our time to insight, from insight to, te to reality was about six months. Insight to validation, six months and a million dollars. Now it should be about 60 minutes and about zero dollars, which has tremendously enabled your ability to do the thing I was talking about, which is try hundreds of things fast. So one of the questions that we got ahead of time actually as well was how, do, how is it different building a company today than it was in the late 90s? You know, you continue to be involved in the entrepreneurial and startup scene. So what are your observations of what's easier? Maybe some things you just mentioned, the plugins and hookups and go live, you know, options, but what's harder in starting a company in today's environment, maybe pre and post COVID as well. Uh, let's leave COVID out of it for the time being. I'm happy to talk sure. about that too. But that's, that's hopefully um, a, a non-perpetual uh, situation. But certainly starting companies is dramatically easier um, now in some ways. Um, and primarily it's that the stack, especially for an internet company, but almost for any company, the technical stack is so much better now that the things you can do for free, um, you can build all the infrastructure with almost no effort, which allows you to focus in on the one thing you're doing, which is unique, which is domain specific. But before, if you did something, you go, I'm a veterinarian and I wanna do this, you had to not only be a great veterinarian, you had to be a great programmer and a great this and a great, you know, all these skills, which meant it was expensive, you needed a team, it was time consuming. And now you can take your domain expertise and all the other expertise is available fairly easily. Um, and I think that's really freed up innovation. It's really sped up um, the rate of innovation. At the same token, if you're doing an early stage company, if you're trying to start something, um, the money is dramatically easier to get now as well. Back then there was venture, but venture was meant for a much more mature company. So when you were trying to start something, uh, you relied on something called the friends and family round, which is what it sounds like, which is you had to go to your friends and your family because they were the only people who were foolish enough to put money into something which had no visible reality that was entirely based on a PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, these days, two things have happened. One is that now the friends and family round is called a seed round because there are actually huge funds that do seed investing. So now there's a whole professional infrastructure that does that, supports those extremely early stage ideas. But the corresponding thing that's happened is that because validating these ideas has become so much easier, because the time from, innovate, from idea to validation is so short, the expectation is that before you even apply for this seed money, you've already done all the groundwork and the legwork to demonstrate that there's a there there. It does not need to be repeatable, does not need to be scalable, but you have to have demonstrated that your idea is real. 
that people really want the thing that you're proposing to give to them, the good or the service. So all those ways, in my opinion, things are much easier. And I'll compound that by saying, boy, the information available. I, I gave you an example of how we learned about the, how the rapidity of testing um, was the real key to rapid innovation. Uh, but now that's taught. There's frameworks for doing that. And we took us you know, years to figure that out. And now people take a class. So the things they're figuring out are next generations um, beyond A and A B testing. We had to figure that out. And now of course, you know, just sign up for service and boom, done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to ask one COVID question and then the, a few participants have some more Netflix specific questions as well. Um, so right now, many companies have way more opportunities or way less opportunities because of sort of current state of the economy. What is your advice for sort of managing when to take risks in this type of, even if it's a short term um, recessionary period and a lot of uncertainty floating around about when it, how long it will last and what its lasting impact may be. Um, what do business leaders need to be thinking about and keeping in mind during this time? Uh, it's a, it's a great question. It's kind of being worked on real time. And I think it's entirely dependent on the type of business you have and in the category you're in. In general, uncertainty is the hardest thing uh, to deal with. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it, if we, for example, knew, oh, this is going to be in place for 47 more days. Then at least right. you can deal with it. But the problem is it could be 47 days, it could be 47 weeks. You just don't know when things return to normal. And so the advice I give to companies varies in their circumstances. For most of the early stage companies I deal with, which have no real visible means of support, and they don't know how long this will last, uh, and the number one objective for a startup is don't run out of money, is to aggressively scale back, to put yourself in a position not where you're prepared to immediately respond, which is an expensive waiting position, but to put yourself almost in the minimal viable state uh, that you can rise back when conditions permit. But you've got to leave yourself where you can survive long enough to wait for the climate to resume, either the customer climate or the funding climate. But one little quick caveat is that it's so dependent. Someone asked me two days ago a very interesting question, which is what if this had happened 22 years ago to me? let's say 21 uh, and a half years ago, three months into starting Netflix. And it would have been very interesting, wouldn't it? Because my biggest competitor was Blockbuster who had 9,000 stores, which all of a sudden were closed. All of a sudden people are spending all their time home watching DVDs. All of a sudden I have a service which uses the mail to send people's movies to them. So what would I have done then? And I won't answer, you certainly can understand how that's a very, very different circumstance um, than a company which uh, it might be saying, all my revenue is gone and it will be gone for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm gonna jump, this will jump around a few of your comments and stories because the questions kind of came in at different points, but um, do you have any advice on hiring people who have good judgment? What are your kind of metrics as you're assembling that team to get to the mountain? What are you looking for and how do you measure that? Um, and I'm gonna do lightning round so that we have a chance to actually take okay, multiple perfect. questions. So the quick answer is it's almost impossible to tell. I mean, you can do this exhaustive hiring process and evaluation process, but fundamentally you're not gonna know until you see them actually make decisions. And so what it means is that you have to recognize you're gonna make mistakes and you have to realize that these mistakes are on you, not necessarily on them. But it does mean that you have to be prepared to say goodbye to somebody. Uh, and it's not brutal. Oh, it is brutal, but it's not, it's not horrible because you're not saying you're a failure and you're out of here. You have to be generous in your severance, but you have to own your mistake, which means you have to deal with it. And if someone does not have good judgment, you can't let it bring down the systems you've built 
um, that allow you to operate at a high degree of autonomy. Um, in other words, you've got to um, hire uh, as best you can, but prepared to own up to your mistakes and correct them. And that usually means letting somebody go. Thanks. Um, this is real, very specific to Netflix, but Laura is asking, she has heard that there's a back-end product at Netflix that use, um, that Microsoft canceled. And were you at Netflix when Microsoft end of life that product? I think it was related to streaming maybe. Um, so having the slightest idea. Okay, great. <laughs> I mean, not great, but it seems like no. <laughs> it's great, believe me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably okay to have some separation in some of those, uh, those spaces. Um, one question, you know, Wyoming is, is known for our hard work and values of community, um, but not necessarily for innovation. And so what do you think we can do in Wyoming to sort of condition ourselves to, to do more iterating? And I, I've heard a few people describe it as, you know, it's all a fishbowl and everybody's watching. And so, um, yeah, how, how, knowing Wyoming and knowing what innovative cultures look like, what do you think we can do to try to increase that here in Wyoming? Sure, innovation is not something that you all of a sudden decide to do. It, it's like any skill, you have to practice it. And like any skill you practice, you have to start off with baby steps before you're ready to do it in a very, very dramatic and aggressive way. Uh, and so you have to start taking risks in small ways um, and that means either you doing it or encouraging your employees to do it um, and making it permissible. And a basic way to think about it, and I'm, now I'm stealing from Jeff Bezos, who he has this concept he calls, uh, there's two-way doors and one-way doors. And what he means is that there's some decisions that are like a one-way door, which is that once you step through, the door slams shut, slams shut behind you. So you would better do a lot of thinking before you step through that door. But there's other things that are like two-way doors where you can step through, and if you don't like what you see, you just step right back. The problem is every company has both types of decisions, but a lot of companies learn a style of decision-making and apply the same style of decision-making to every decision. So one of the things that's helpful is to look at these decisions you're making, look at these things you wanna try and ask yourself, is this a one-way door or a two-way door? And if it's a two-way door, if you can try something and if it doesn't work, step right back. That's the perfect place to start getting experience with how it feels to do iterative processes or things that you're prepared for them not to work. And you're largely doing them to see what happens. Practice makes perfect. Awesome. That, that's a great analogy. I like that a lot. Um, another question. Um, as times change and the needs change with a company, how do you find the means to bring in new ideas when maybe the staff were part of the last new idea and they like that version of that, that new idea? And so how do you continue to inspire them with the next new idea? So I got bad news is that um, it's hard to change people overnight in being receptive and open to doing things different ways. And if your company has been doing the same thing the same way for a long time, the odds are you filled it with people who are really good at that and really like that. And the reason that companies like Netflix are so successful in these dramatically changing environments is from the very beginning, we have said to ourselves, we never wanna let that happen to us. We always wanna make sure that every single person who works here is the type of person who's constantly asking themselves, is this thing that I'm seeing where I need to go, regardless of what the past looks like? It's really hard. And in some ways, it's what gives hope to all these hundreds of thousands of little startups that are coming after the established companies, because they know that even though the senior leadership of a company may see what they have to do, they just can't turn that boat quickly enough. But you don't need to despair, you have time. And part of it is recognizing it's gonna take a long time to get my people comfortable with making decisions based on what things look like now, not on what they've been for the last two or three years. Uh, 
And that just requires you to start giving people examples. And the last thing I can mention to that, and I said lightning round, but I can't help it, is that culture is not coming from what you say. It's coming from what you do. And the worst thing you can do is get up in front of your group and say, everyone needs to be embracing change and taking risks. And now I'd like to recognize some of the big achievers in our companies. Let's bring up the people who hit their sales numbers this quarter. No. What you want to do is then bring up the people who tried something and screwed it up because they tried it. And you want to show people that's what you want your company to look like and feel like. Uh, culture is not what you say, what you do. And more specifically, it's who you hire, it's who you fire, and it's who you reward. Um, simple, awesome. as, simple as that. So, it's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy to change culture. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I am curious, you know, I, I am noticing a large margin of change and even of grace in our society right now as people are forced into this new paradigm of working from home, managing their kids' school, you know, all of these rules that we have lived by that have changed because of COVID. Do you think there are lasting impacts to business and even to the way tech hubs form or, you know, will Silicon Valley be Silicon Valley again, knowing that we've learned to, it, we've been forced to iterate during this pandemic and will we all just sort of take a deep breath and go back to life as it was? Or will some of these new patterns and technologies and new comfort with things like a Zoom meeting um, change the way we do business? Well, let's hope so. I mean, let's hope that there are some great things that come out of, um, out of this, which is so tragic in so many ways. You know, so everyone's, people are losing their jobs. It's, it's horrendous and dying. Um, but hopefully, Will come out the back end and have learned some positive things. And one is, this is a great example. You know, all these companies who said we can't do remote work are going, this actually isn't so terrible. There's some things that of course need in person, but maybe we can do more of this and have this work. And maybe that can lead to um, people who do need to be able to work from home or do need to have more flexible schedules. So that would certainly be a positive thing. I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I, you know, I have my three adult children home living with me and it's wonderful. Um, oh, I should have told you to put Morgan on this call. That's who I really want to see. <laughs> yeah, she, I'll bring her in. I'll bring her in yeah, afterwards. Perfect. <laughs> she's, in, she's in watching Frozen. That's the kind of oh, thing good. she's doing in the middle of the day now. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm serious. It, and, and there's a, a, a reconnection that's taking place. Um, I mean, I'm calling friends and talking to them on the telephone way more frequently than I used to. Let's hope we hold on to that. Uh, my life has slowed down dramatically. I used to travel probably two weeks out of four and I'm going, why was I doing, I'm enjoying being home so much. I'm going, why was I doing that? Let's hope that sticks with us. And then I'll give a, you know, as, as my, put my environmentalist hat on for a second. I don't have it here. My environmentalist hat for a minute. And, uh, you know, I don't, it probably is different. Maybe it's, not, maybe it's not, not different where you are, but certainly I look from where I see, I can see visible changes in the air quality. Mm -hmm. And certainly it's seen even more dramatically in places like Los Angeles and New York and even San Francisco. And I'm hoping that just lets people know that there is alternatives to uh, necessarily living the way we're, uh, we're living. So all, lots of, I hope, uh, silver linings. Sure. Yeah. I know Jared Stack, who's on this phone call, and I have had a few conversations um, of Wyoming might be a nice landing place for people who figure out during this time that they don't need to live in a city and they can work remotely and they do actually appreciate a slower pace of life and that's kind of our recipe here and what maybe you'll have to like to shovel snow a little bit as well but if you can put up with that piece then maybe there's an opportunity even for wyoming to be a landing space as people recognize those values and capabilities as we emerge i don't know if you have any thoughts on that no, I think it's a phenomenal idea, but of course you have to recognize there's a whole ecosystem that needs to get put into place to make those sort of things work. I mean, transportation would be a good one. Um, culturally would be another good one. Uh, diversity would be another good one. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I think you all know I'm the chair of the Knowles board um, and uh, we, we're being as aggressive as we can to bring diversity into the ranks just so we have different points of view. And it's hard for some people to 
come live in Lander, Wyoming. Um, and again, I started this off by saying how much I love it, but um, it, to make it a, a accessible to a broader population, Wyoming has, uh, has some, some things that it can work on. Um, but I think it's a great, great objective. I think it'd be wonderful for the state. It'd be wonderful for business here. Uh, maybe great for the world to see more of a, such an amazing place. Awesome. We're zeroing in on the last few minutes, so I'll give kind of a final call um, if anyone has questions. Aaron asked a question about um, how do we teach people to think critically and not just, you know, feed them information and answers, but to ask why. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we create that, that way of thinking? Yeah, my, in my opinion, it's entirely how you ask the question. Uh, it, certainly at Netflix, where we were extremely data driven, we spent almost more times deciding what would success look like than we did actually looking at the results afterwards. In other words, we really defined, we're trying something, how are we going to know if it works? And that's a discipline of people recognizing a lot of these things are data driven um, and being data driven helps because it, it makes it egoless. It makes it less about whose opinion it is and more about how well supported it is. It's a, a cultural thing, not easy, not easy at all, but all these things um, blend together. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, Erica has a long question for our last two minutes, which is pretty typical of Erica. <laughs> but um, any, when, what category of challenges took the most amount of your time, let's say, at Netflix? Was it managing staff, developing the concept, raising capital? What was kind of the biggest focus? I mean, all of those were in focus, but what was the largest focus for you in your seat? I'm going to answer it slightly differently with the assurance that it applied to Netflix as well. So since I left Netflix, I, I didn't have an enemy to start another company. So I've been working with other founders as a mentor, helping them hopefully achieve the same success I've had. And when I did that, I thought I'll be helping them with positioning and go to market strategy and product or tech stack or fundraising. But the thing I spend the most time on is the interpersonal stuff, is how do they deal with their themselves, with their family, with their personal time? How do they keep their marriage together? How do they get along with their co-founder? How do they work with the board? How do they manage employees? It turns out that's a huge, huge, huge piece of making any company successful. So far and away, being a successful leader um, is recognizing that you do a fraction of the work, a small, tiny fraction of the work. Most of the work is done by the others. And your job is to put them in a position where they can do their work effectively, where they're motivated to do it, where they enjoy coming to work, where they've given a sense that they can have balance in their life. Um, and wow, you, that is worth every minute of focus that you put into it. Awesome. Well, that's actually a great full circle way to end um, in thinking about the lessons that you learned um, with a backpack on your back um, traveling through Wyoming. And so Thank you so much for giving us um, an hour of your time. Um, it means a lot to get to hear stories from you firsthand. Um, I'm gonna unmute everyone um, so that folks can give a word of thanks and a hello as we <laughs> sign off um, to, make, to add a little human element since they've been silenced the whole time. Um, but let's give cheers, round of applause and thanks to Mark for joining, so. Thanks to you. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks for joining. We will um, post this if you want to share it with anyone else around Wyoming. So thank you and all the best as you head back to work. Stay safe, stay sane, all those things. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Mandy. Thank yeah, thank you.